This week on Wealth Track, a financial thought leader who is not afraid to go against the crowd. Investment strategist Francois Trahan makes the case for an economic and market rebound in the face of evidence to the contrary. Next on Consuelo Mac, Wealth Track. The company you keep is also the company we keep. Together we help provide a lifetime of guaranteed income and investment solutions. Hello, I'm Consuelo Mack. I want to tell you about a new opportunity to watch Consuelo Mack Wealth Track before the program appears on public television. As a subscriber, you can see programs 48 hours in advance of the general public and also find timely interviews and commentaries exclusive to WealthTrack premium subscribers. If you're interested, just go to WealthTrack.com for more information. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this edition of WealthTrack. I'm Consuelo Mack. It's nice to be able to focus on some positive news for a change. And as you will discover in a moment, this week's guest is one of the most upbeat financial thought leaders out there right now, at least for the next several months. Here are some developments he's following that might lift your spirits as well. The devastation in the housing market, the largest asset held by many Americans, appears to be healing and improving. Although still at depressed levels, new home construction called housing starts in the trade recently rose to the highest level in nearly four years and confidence among home builders climbed by the most since 2002. Even Federal Reserve Chief Ben Bernanke noted the modest signs of improvement in housing in his otherwise somber remarks recently. And for those of you contemplating buying a home, they have never been more affordable. The U.S. Housing Affordability Index is at a record high due largely to record low mortgage rates. Of course, qualifying for a mortgage is another matter. It is still very difficult for many Americans. Another positive trend, inflation. It is decelerating. We can thank falling oil prices over the last few months for putting more money in our pockets. The Fed now predicts that its favorite measure of inflation, the Price Index for Personal Consumption Expenditures, or PCE, will be under the Fed's targeted 2% level and below last year's 2.5% rate not only a boost to the economy, but giving the Fed some flexibility to provide more monetary stimulus if it sees the need. By one count, there have been well over 200 stimulative policy initiatives around the world in the past 11 months. That is a lot of economic juice. Meanwhile, as this week's guest has been telling clients recently, investor sentiment is as low as it's been since the financial crisis. Investors are still net sellers of stock mutual funds and buyers of bonds, even though a record high number of stocks, about 60% of S&P 500 companies, now pay dividend yields greater than the yield on the 10-year U.S. Treasury note. Well, our guest this week is Francois Trahan, Vice Chairman, Chief Investment Strategist, and Head of Quantitative Research at investment research boutique Wolf Trahan. Institutional investors have ranked him either the number one or two portfolio strategist on Wall Street for the past eight years. He is also co-author of the recently published book, The Era of Uncertainty, Global Strategies for Inflation, Deflation, and the Middle Ground, which I highly recommend. I began the interview by asking him why, after several years of bearishness, he turned bullish last October. Um, because leading indicators of the economy were beginning to turn a corner. So for the last two years almost, I've been using the mantra, inflation is the new Fed funds rate. And what I mean by that is that in a world where the Fed funds rate is at zero, what you find is that inflation becomes a more important barometer of the economy. When inflation goes up, consumers feel as if there's a tax being imposed on them. The economy tends to slow in the wake of that. That's what you saw in the wake of QE2. But it works in reverse. When inflation goes down, consumers feel like they have more money in their pockets. When the price of gasoline goes down, clothing, food, et cetera. And what you tend to see in the wake of that is a better economy. So leading up to uh, last October, what we'd seen is a big decline in inflation, which finally was starting to have an impact on leading indicators of the economy and by the same token on the equity market. 
So you, Francois Trahan at, at Wolf Trahan, now that instead of watching the Fed funds rate religiously, like many other people have done over their careers. So I used to be a huge Fed watcher. Right. It used to be the only thing that mattered for the economy, but the Fed took away my ability to do that in, October, in December of 08, sorry, when they took the Fed funds rate down to zero. And it's from that point on that you start to see that inflation began to play a bigger role in the business cycle. And so I now call myself an inflation watcher. That's the biggest driver of the business cycle today. So uh, let me ask you about now, because we are seeing what seems to be an economic slowdown. We've got unemployment rising. We've got corporate earnings are, are weakening. Uh, and you know, so the question is, this soft patch that we're going through, why do you think it's a soft patch, i.e. that we're going to get out of it and not something more uh, you know, lengthy? Well, there's no doubt that what's happening is about the economy. If you think of when the stock market ran into difficulties, which was late March, early April, it's when leading indicators of the economy started faltering. So you see initial jobless claims that began to rise. All the regional PMIs, those regional leading indicators started to come down. Purchasing managers indexes, Purchasing right. managers indices, People buying exactly. stuff, yeah. Exactly, and so it's clear that it's about the economy, but as long as you have low inflation, what you're gonna have is data points that will eventually recover. And we've, we're beginning to see that now in the month of July. So, so far we have three leading indicators have been released for the month of July, all three are up. National Association of Home Builders Index rose to a five-year high. The economy is about to fall off a cliff going into recession. Why is that going up to a five-year high? And to me, that's a great barometer of how consumers feel. It can't be that bad if home builders are doing okay. Um, we have the Empire Fed Index, which came out for July, went up. The Philly Fed Index for July went up. So I think we're slowly exiting this soft patch and when we write the history of this cycle, we're not going to remember these last three months. We're going to remember that in October, the stock market bottomed and it continued to power through 2012. So there has been a pattern over the last three years of, of the economy doing you know, really well kind of in the, in the fall and into the winter. And then in the, in the spring, like we have now, that the economy starts to falter. And then there is a market rout. So you know, a, a year ago, August, uh, in three days, the S&P 500 went down 12%, which is really sp has spooked investors. So why don't you think that could happen again? Right. Well, a year ago, what you were facing were the lagged effects of inflation. Inflation was very high. Central banks around the world had raised rates. What you have today is the exact opposite. Inflation has come down remarkably, sitting at a cycle low in the U.S. and in many countries around the world. And you've seen central banks cut rates around the world. So a year ago, you have tightening in the pipeline. Today, you have easing in the pipeline. What follows in the wake of easing is better economic data points. So I think this is a completely different animal. I think you're about to see a recovery in stocks and probably a melt up in stocks. If you look at where sentiment is right now, people are very skeptical of this recovery. Right, everyone so, wants out of stocks. Right, and yet the S&P is up over 100 points from where it was in early June. So think about this, the S&P is up 100 points on bad data and beta in the market that hasn't really contributed. So cyclical sectors that haven't really worked. I think both of those things are about to change. So imagine what happens when the data starts to improve. We're seeing glimmers of that now and beta starts to kick in where all of a sudden the cyclical industries begin to work. You know, that's a very powerful combination for equities, at least in the short run. The naysayers are, are looking at the headlines and, and they're saying Eurozone crisis has not gone away. We've got an election coming up. We have no idea what's going to happen there. And we've got this fiscal cliff. So all of the same things incidentally that were in play except for the election a year ago when, when the market went through that route. So where do those figure in, in your calculus? Well, th those are all legitimate concerns. You know, the fiscal issues in the U.S. I think are a structural concern. The state of the euro is a structural concern. But the reality is there's lots of ways to kick the can. You can kick the can with policy or sometimes the business cycle can do it for you. So if you think back to last fall, when leading indicators of the economy started to rise, even in Europe, they started to rise, all of a sudden CDS spreads, right, what we, what we call country risk, the CDS spreads started to narrow. It means the country risk started to go away. Right, the credit default swaps, which are like insurance policies. So if the premiums go up, that means there's more risk. If they go down, there's That's less. That's exactly right. Okay. And so leading indicators started to go up, means the economic outlook improved just a little bit. But all of a sudden, the CDS spreads began to narrow. And so it felt like the euro crisis was resolving itself. Of course, you're not going to resolve it, but you're going to get the impression that you're resolving it for a while. To me, it's kicking the can, but you know, those can be very powerful moves. And I think we're staring at one now. So, so let's talk about how powerful, because you're saying that, in fact, that the S&P 500 could reach an all-time high in the next several months. 
Why? So we're up over 100 points from the low. The S&P is off 3 to 4% from its peak, which okay. we reached in late March. But what's strange is people are behaving as if it's off 30%. It's off 3 to 4 You know, things aren't that bad. So sentiment, very, very skeptical. You look at the surveys of bullish consensus. Right now, sitting at the same levels, you mentioned August of last year, we're sitting at those levels. That's how skeptical people are. At a point in time where I think the data is about to surprise on the upside. That's a very powerful combination. That's how you get a melt up in equities. And so I think it is possible that the S&P goes to a new all time high. That's about 1550. It's a little ambitious. I think if it goes to 1450, it's a huge surprise for people to be quite honest. But you know, when moves start initially, it's just return to the mean. People acknowledge that they've been wrong. You know, and eventually what they do is they extrapolate. You know, they will believe that this cycle will be sustainable. I've seen this movie before. And that's how you know, equities end up overshooting. So you know, nothing has changed in my structural view of the world, but I think in the next few months, what you're going to see is a very powerful stock market. And, and let's be quite clear about this. You're talking about the next few months. This is not a long-term bull call anticipation. This is within you know, a business cycle. And so you're basically couple quarters, advising- Couple quarters maybe, something couple quarters. to the end of the year, maybe early next right. year. So, so you're telling your clients, who are institutional clients essentially, not individuals, you're telling them what's the strategy to follow. Um, well, it's to be, to be aggressive and to believe in cyclical sectors and beta, what we call the risk on trade. Everything that is a uh, risk on asset, that's equities, that's the cyclical industries. When you're picking stocks, it's emphasizing those high beta names. So it's, it's, it's financials, for instance, right? Absolutely. It's uh, what, material stocks? I mean, things that sure. you know, go, go up when the economy yeah. does well. And it's European equities. You know, European fit, equities. Of course. Everything that has worked in the last couple months has been risk off. Right. Defensive so issues. Defensive. Healthcare. So, I mean, but it's REITs, not just healthcare. Utilities. It's also the U.S. dollar. It's U.S. Treasuries. You know, and think about it. The ten-year Treasury bond yield is around one and a half percent. You know, people are so fearful of the world right now that they've piled into Treasuries, and so at some point when they start to believe that the data is indeed going to improve, money is going to come out of that defensive trade. And it's going to go right into the other trade, which is the, the risk on trade or the cyclical trade. And I think you're going to get a very powerful move in equities. So the point is, this really could turn on a dime. I mean, it's something. So, so are you advising clients to kind of get set now and to start moving out of defensive issues yeah. and into, mm -hmm. you know, so the risk trade, the, the more cyclical issues starting now? And I mean, in a major way or yeah. incrementally or what? Well, so what we did in June is we said, if you believe this is a soft patch, if you believe the market has suffered because of a soft patch in the economy, then we're going to be out of this. You're going to have a big green light for equities when the soft patch is over. So we made a checklist. You know, what are the data points that you want to look at? So we want to look at initial jobless claims. We want to look you at. You want the, them to come down. You want them to come down. Right. You want to look at the NHB index. That's one that already gets a check mark because it's risen a lot. You want right. to look at the PMIs. They're starting Again, to rise. Purchasing managers, right? That's, you want to look at the builders. European uh, PMIs, you know, as well. Uh, you're starting to see some of those data points beginning to turn, and so. You know, to me, you're, you're pretty much there. We're exiting the soft patch right, right as we speak. Now, an, another you know, big piece of evidence for, for the bulls it is that, that I think 60%, around 60% of the S&P 500 companies, their dividend yields are higher than the, the yields on 10-year Treasury notes, something that you know, never, if ever, happens. Yep. And so they're saying that makes stocks that much more attractive. This is a very unusual opportunity. But if you look at the, the yields on the 10-year Treasury notes, for instance, they are artificially suppressed by the Federal Reserve, correct? And, and, and the fact is that most individuals, for instance, and institutions, except unless you're Chinese or Japanese, don't buy treasuries. What they're buying is corporate credit. They're buying corporate bonds. Mm -hmm. So why is that such a big deal, given the fact that very few people own treasuries except for other governments and the carry trade, uh, and, and also that it's the 10-year treasury note is, is the yield is artificially de depressed I, I think, by the Fed? I think that just goes to show you how fearful people are. They're willing to buy the 10-year treasury at any yield, at any valuation, at any level, to not own equities. So 60% of stocks in the S&P right now yield more than the 10-year treasury. Why wouldn't you buy dividend-paying stocks instead of the 10-year treasury? If you, just as a frame of reference, at the low point in the market in early 2009, 50% of stocks yielded more than 10-year treasury. So this is a bigger opportunity in that sense than it was back then. Uh, so I think the trade-off is very, very interesting. This is not where a bear market begins. This is usually where a rally begins. 
So as I said earlier, your clients are institutional clients and they're judging their performance every quarter. The rest of us, mere mortals, the individuals, you know, we just want to make money and we don't want to lose money. So, so, so the, the things that have worked really well for us uh, have been more defensive issues. I mean, treasuries have been a great investment for many, many years now. The, the more defensive plays, uh, you know, the, the health care stocks and, uh, and utilities have been really good places to be. So should we be changing what's been a winning game so far as well, individuals? Yeah, I think if we go back to the trade-off between stocks and bonds, so when we're talking about 60% of the S&P yielding more than a 10-year, I think that's a big message in itself. It's telling you, you know, that you should emphasize equities, at least dividend-paying stocks, over uh, over treasuries. And so, if you're thinking longer term, you know, ignore what I just said about the market going up for the next couple quarters. But you're thinking longer term, what should be the right strategy? To me, uh, it made sense to own treasuries when you know the yield was interesting at these levels. I think dividend-paying stocks are almost a no-brainer. And, uh, you know, and, and again, looking at people being so risk averse, when you look at Japan, for instance, and, and a, a lot of people are talking about it, and I, and I want to take you now to th be thinking longer term, because even though you, you are short term, you're cyclically bullish, the secular picture, the long term picture, you think is highly problematical. So, so what, what is, what's your longer term outlook as, as far as, you know, what we're going to face in this country, in the economy, in the markets? A, a lot of pain, unfortunately. You know, longer term, we do have phenomenal headwinds. And that's different from the 80s and 90s when we had phenomenal tailwinds. You know, for 20 years, we had declining interest rates, friendly fiscal policy, commodity prices that were declining, you know, for 20 years. Right. So where consumers were feeling an ongoing tax cut, if you will. Uh, it's hard to come up with any sort of tailwinds to the U.S. economy nowadays. There's, you know, if you search, you can find a couple, but you can't argue that the, you know, the 10-year Treasury bond yield will come down 13 percentage points when it's sitting at 1.5%. It just can't happen. The federal government can't give you friendly fiscal policy when the deficit is 8% to GDP. And so longer term, this is a very, very difficult backdrop. It's going to be subpar GDP, I think, as far as the eye can see. Uh, so I think for stocks, you know, this is an opportunity that you're not going to get very often. But to me, the comparison to Japan is interesting because in the 20 years, you know, where the Japanese stock market has basically done nothing, right. you have seen major opportunities. Four times you saw the Nikkei rally in excess of 50%. Wow. 50%. Four times in the last 20 years. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. but, and all four of those occurred in the wake of lower inflation which is a form of stimulus. In any economy where official rates are at zero, lower inflation is gonna give you a little bit of oomph, if you will. It's not the same thing as the Fed cutting rates, but it's the next best thing in the absence of that. You know, it's, it's so interesting because, again, so the, the fact is during even a lost decade or a lost two decades, then there are, op there are money-making opportunities. And, but it strikes me as, uh, you know, one of the things that you told me when I've talked to you before is that basically the buy and hold strategy is dead. Correct. And do you feel that way for individuals as well, that, that, you, that you really, you yourself or your financial advisor has to be much more nimble? You've got to take advantage of these, you know, four times in 20 years when the market's going to go up 50%. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this is one of those times. I think this is one of those times, yeah. Um, you know, I think we're in the midst of it uh, right now. The ideal entry point was last October, but we're somewhere, you know, midway in that rally. Um, I do think it's one of those times. You know, for 20 years, the S&P went up 18% a year on average. That's the 80s and 90s for you. That's a world where buy and hold works really well. You know, now we're in a much more volatile marketplace, and so I think it's important to be more cycle aware and to pick your entry points much more carefully, absolutely. Looking uh, at, at what the, the, at the situation of the consumer as well, we, we went through this you know, historic credit bubble. And one of the things that you said that is really going to affect us for really for the next generation is, is the consumer deleveraging. So all of that debt that, that we acquired, that deleveraging, is, is that basically the, the biggest overhang, the biggest headwind that, that we face? Yeah, I think it is. I would tell you that most people I speak with believe that it's the deficit at the federal level that is the big issue. I don't think that's a big issue. I think Why not? Well, we can resolve it. You know, we have the Simpson-Bowles plan, which tells you how to balance the budget. You know, it's doable. It's not fun. It's painful. You know, it's going to lead to slower growth, but there is a way out of this. And if we want, we can resolve it like this. 
Um, and, and it might be resolved, at least the, the budget deficit might be resolved if the sequestration takes. Well, at least part it, of it. Right, yeah. part of it. And we'll put up a big but, dent in it. Yeah. Uh, but consumer debt, you can't resolve you know, by clicking your fingers. You know, unfortunately, it's debt. And debt needs to be reimbursed or it needs to be shrunk as a percentage of the economy. But either way, it's something that I think will take a generation or longer. And so to me, that's the big overhang. Deleveraging is the big overhang. You know, we had phenomenal GDP in the 80s and 90s because we kept adding credit and debt. And now we're in a process where we're doing the exact opposite. And that means subpar GDP as I see it. That's the bigger issue. So let me ask you about some of the things that you're very positive about. And, and one of them is the natural gas and basically extracting uh, natural gas from shale. We're seeing a big boom, energy boom, in, in, uh, in the Dakotas in North Dakota right now. So you know, what's your uh, assessment of our energy situation and why that could actually make a big difference in the economy? That's pretty much the only. Uh, oh, it's the only one. Well, it's the only <laughs> structural tailwind I can think about. But right. I think what's happening is, uh, is potentially a game changer in many ways. You know, it's not going to change necessarily the path of the stock market in the next few years. But to me, it's something that can have an influence on our politics, our policies, our economy, you know, on a tremendous amount of things. It's, if it's the path to energy independence, it makes a huge difference. If you think about our, our trade balance, you know, a big portion of that is oil imports. You know, and so Many, it, much of it from Canada, actually. Uh, absolutely. Right. So you know, the initial step is Middle East independence, you know, possibly. Uh, but eventually, maybe this is the path to, to energy independence you know, altogether. And so, you know, I think this can really change uh, a lot of things in the economy. What is it about the technology and the energy industry that, that you think is so, could be so crucial? Well, I think there's a lot of people that still are in denial about this. People don't necessarily believe that the new technology, you know, can make a huge difference. And so um, people are skeptical. I'm just trying to gain knowledge in that area. I think it's absolutely possible. I forgot who was the first analyst that wrote, you know, this report that said that there is a path to energy independence in the U.S. I remember running it through uh, a couple clients that are energy specialists, and what they would say is, well, that's impossible. And you know, my answer is, well, what if it is possible? What if it does happen? You know, that really changes the way the U.S. operates. So is, is there an investment play uh, in, in, in this opportunity that you see that, that, that you're telling clients about? Well, so far, you know, I would tell you the investment play has been in consumer stocks. You know, because the decline in natural gas prices has been very much like a tax cut for consumers. I think mm -hmm. it's been a big part of this decline in inflation that we've seen so far this year. And so I would say so far it's been the equity market overall and more specifically the consumer names that I think have been the biggest beneficiaries of it. One of the things that's also occurring on the inflation front is that we've, we've had you know, serious droughts in the Midwest uh, and in other parts of the world as well driving food prices up. How big a concern is that? You know, ideally I'd like to see all prices go down. I think that's the, the, way, the way to benefit the consumer the most. Um, ultimately, I would say energy prices much more important than food prices. You can double the cost of grains. You know, the cost of your cereal box will go up. Not that much because a big portion of it is cardboard and marketing, but it will still go up. You know, you can't double the cost of gasoline without having a huge impact on the U.S. economy. So we always ask our guests, what is the one investment for a long-term diversified portfolio that we should all own some of? What is your recommendation for dividend, us? Dividend, dividend, dividend. That's the, that's the recommendation. You know, we were talking about how the strategy in the 80s and 90s was buy and hold. You know, in a world where the market's a lot more volatile, I think income is the way to go. Obviously, Treasury's not appealing at these levels. Uh, dividend paying stocks, in my opinion, are a phenomenal opportunity here. And I know your compliance officers do not allow you to, to make a specific recommendation, but we went to Morningstar to find out you know, what their favorite kind of dividend uh, ETF was, uh, a low fees in the ETFs, and it's the Morningstar favorite is the Vanguard Dividend Appreciation Fund. The symbol is VIG, so we just wanted to pass that on to our viewers. So Francois Trahan, it's so great to have you on WealthTrack. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. At the conclusion of every wealth track, we usually leave you with an action point. This week, we are deviating a bit, as we traditionally do around this time of year, to give you a reading suggestion for your summer vacation. This one is from our guest, Francois Trahan. Trahan recommends The Quest, Energy, Security, and the Remaking of the Modern World by Daniel Jurgen. The Quest is a follow-up to the author's Pulitzer Prize-winning history of the oil industry called The Prize. 
As Drahan told me, energy is his number one topic of interest. He is trying to learn everything he can about it because he believes it has the power to shape our economy, living standards, politics, and place in the world. He is very optimistic about the possibly game-changing technology that extracts natural gas from shale and its potential to make the U.S. energy independent. And on that hopeful note, we will conclude this edition of Wealth Track. Next week, our guest will be bond manager Robert Kessler, who has consistently given Wealth Track viewers the best investment advice of the last seven years, which is to own U.S. Treasury bonds. You'll find out why he is sticking with this contrarian call. If you would like to watch this program again, please go to our website, WealthTrack.com. It will be available as streaming video or a podcast no later than Sunday night. And that concludes this edition of Wealth Track. Thank you for watching. Have a great weekend and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. Additional funding provided by Loomis Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally. Wintergreen, your home for global value. And Tocqueville Asset Management, contrarian investors combining independent thought with in-depth research.